Welcome back to the podcast, Bruce. Uh, Hi, everybody. If you'd like to, if you'd like to give us a quick rundown on 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 the legislation and 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 some of the background information that is is useful to Australian businesses. Absolutely, yeah. and one of the reasons we're doing this particular podcast is purely because um, people aren't aware of uh, you know the gamut of legislative requirements that uh, that sit in the background. Um, that you're probably never going to uh, bump into unless something happens. Um, and that's the uh, the goal of Safety Hut is to ensure that not only do you have the tools uh, to um, uh, gather evidence and traceability in regards to you doing everything that's reasonably practical for your workers and your, and your company at large, um, but you've got a support network in Safety Hut in providing uh, other tools and documentations and videos and uh, um, to be able to help out if there's a issue happening. You don't need to know legislation back to front. When you see all the gamut of things that uh, that uh, relate to a, a business, which so is um, uh, it's uh, mind numbing. Is it's like me trying to explain, and I'm sure in our last couple of podcasts you've seen me uh, rattle on about legislation. Uh, most people's uh, eyes glaze over or brain turns off uh, and um, there's nothing wrong with that is that you focus on your production and supply and uh, the service uh, you know i believe is groundbreaking that we provide is not only the tools but also the network the ability to research the the, the knowing the right people to go to to ask the right questions um, to be able to put controls in place uh, if an incident had happened that was unforeseen and we need to be able to uh, put something in place and have good evidence and traceability. By that support is that, uh, that our little safety hub machine can get everything sorted out and give you right advice so you can make a decision. But more importantly, you can continue on with your production and supply. Even a significant incident that um, impacts your other workers is that we can advise because we're we have that experience or advise of the things that, that can happen, even if it uh, bleeds over into uh, fair work uh, um, responsibilities. Um, we can give you the heads up and help you and work with you to be able to, um, you know, facilitate those things. Most businesses have, uh, you know, little things happen, but there's the big ones that, that, that are a problem. Yeah, it's a really valuable service, Bruce, because... That complete management of Safety Hut means that a lot of this legislation that you know confuses myself um, isn't really you know it's such a time-consuming thing to understand it all. And and like you mentioned, there's there's fair work, there's workplace health and safety, there's a bunch of in, um, requirements for businesses that a lot of businesses aren't, aren't quite aware of at the moment. So that's yeah, probably yeah. Like to, to get out and, of this and- podcast is increase that awareness, I guess as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, if we didn't have, one of the reasons that, you know, legislation is, is, has developed over the years is because uh, like with any tool uh, that we use, the thing that's been learned uh, is, um, is best, um, uh, you know, if you record it down and you've and it eliminated or mitigated or limited uh, a particular um um, incident occurring is uh, the next person coming down. If you tried to do that uh, instruction or training buddy system, uh, that's going to change over time. So uh, it's like the old, uh, you know, whispering technique. You tell uh, people down the line a particular saying to say, but if it gets to the last person, um, the thing that they were telling them is completely different. Um, so having tools, whether they're um, you know, nowadays, especially videos, um, you know, that's uh, something that uh, Safety Hut has, uh, we now t- are taking in big time uh, with the podcasts and we're going to be using those for toolboxes and safety committee meetings, as I've already mentioned, is um, uh, uh, where, where the uh, uh, part of your team that uh, um, does the research, knows where to look, knows who to talk to, uh, to be able to firstly populate your um, your, your work hub software, but secondly, to be that point of contact uh, 
uh, doesn't matter the doesn't matter the size of your um, business. Um, we're there to to look after the the small businesses that want to stay small and the small businesses that want to grow big, uh, and uh, even the, the businesses that are medium to large now. Um, even if you just want to be part of our network, um, you know, certainly subscribe to our, our podcast channel, um, and um, um, we're more than happy to have people comment and give their experiences to be able to assist um, us uh, collectively in being able to help. There's lots of associations and and uh, and other organisations out there to do with safety, but we're trying to be, um, you know. Sp- speaking for, for layman's terms, you know, to, to make it easy to understand um, and, and not to worry about it, to know that someone's working with you to be able to help your organisation. And I've said before, is we're not perfect. We don't claim to be perfect. We certainly have all the tools to be able to, to uh, deliver the service uh, in a manner that's uh, expected. Um, and uh, if mistakes are made, uh, we learn from those mistakes. Um, they're all recorded. Uh, so, and that's the whole point uh, of a good safety system: is you analyse your risk. You know, uh, you know, you well, identify, analyse, and and put controls in place. Uh, but there's the unexpected thing too: the thing you're not expecting. Um, and a lot of people don't realise uh, is that the human element is such a big thing. You can have the most responsible worker on the face of the earth um, and they have a bad day, whether it's a you know, difficulty at home or whatever, um, and that uh, results in um, a distraction uh, ending up in a, in a serious injury or, or, or something similar. And um, then you've got young workers, uh, so inexperienced, older workers, complacency, um, you know, so... When you have humans interacting uh, at a workplace, even if it's um, you know it's, uh, something you would think is um, very limited risk, you know, like selling dresses in a shop, for instance, there's always the unexpected thing that could happen as well. And remembering, even if it's the the impact comes from a, uh, a um, aggression from the member of the public, is that your workers are still workers, you know, and that's still an incident. Um, so. Anyway, uh, let's let's get going, and I'll bring up um, my little uh, presentation, so we can just have this conversation together. Um, and um, feel free uh, to comment. So I'd like to thank everybody so far uh, for our, um, our our first uh, video. It's doing quite well on YouTube. Uh, the second one will be up shortly, uh, hopefully uh, in the next couple of days. So uh, for the first time, we've got the shorts going off into um, into the other uh, um, social media areas, you know, the um, LinkedIn and and uh, and uh, Facebook and all that. So thank you very much, Fung, uh, our editor and chief. Uh, <laughs> she's she's and, doing a fantastic job. And thank you to the viewers. Uh, we've it was it was quite a quite a quite a surprise to see that we've got you know so much. Uh, so much feedback there with the with the views and the and the, yeah generally with the with the overall impact that it's had so far so it's good to see uh, hey, thanks very much go so Bruce overall with this with the legislation would you say that uh, actually I'll, I'll let you I'll let you lead here because I, I'm I'm not too sure what exactly the the businesses would need to look into if they were wanting to, you know, if they're wanting to have a bit more of a broad view on on legislation, safety yeah, legislation. The whole idea of this presentation is 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 not to scare you, is to show you how much legislation there is, the things that we're not uh, familiar with, and and what could an impact on a business. Um, you know, leading off from safety. I mean, safety's been around for. Um, a fair amount of time, but in a in a reasonable form, uh, funnily enough, not that long. And you see the the, um, the page I've got up in front of you where it refers to a report done by uh, Lord Robin in the UK, um, and uh, that report uh, was a result of uh, many incidents. Uh, one in particular, 
um, where um, a uh, coal slurry um, from a coal mine that was sort of mounted up uh, flowed through a town and and uh, killed a lot of children uh, that were in a school. But I'm pretty sure there's a movie about it as well. Uh, and uh, in injuring people, killing people, um, you know, and it obviously impacts on, uh, you know, people's, uh, the way they feel towards their workplace and, uh, you know, uh, and on productivity. I mean, uh, things have to stop uh, while those things are dealt with. And so they uh, ended up uh, coming up with a, um, a report uh, that Lord Broburn did and uh, as a result of that, they decided to um, ensure that uh, practices were uh, the same and that um, uh, that uh, companies um, took on the responsibility of themselves as well. Um, now, that's going back to this report was in 1970 and 1972, um, so some time ago. Um, and then, as I spoke about in one of the other podcast, our first podcast is um, uh, in Australia. Is we ended up with um, legislation that was uh, based on on uh, um, this report, but different in every state. Okay, there was uh, things that were wildly different to uh, uh, one state to another. So. Um, when What's the, the reason um, for that, Bruce? With the sorry. yeah, you can What's you can look at Australia. As, as, yeah, you, it is a good question that I hadn't thought of until you brought that one up. Actually, is uh, you can look at Australia as different countries, uh, the states. Is um, even to the point when I was young, my father, um, uh, being a Western Australian, worked on um, uh, a railway line as they built them. Uh, back then, all the big railway lines were going in across Australia, uh, called the Standard Gauge Railway Line. Uh, I didn't really know what that meant until later on when I found out that the other side of Australia, the eastern states, um, had a narrow gauge uh, railway line system. Uh, and there was a time, and I can't remember exactly, uh, people might be able to tell me, is uh, I think it was in Adelaide, where freight coming from Western Australia or from the eastern states got to this point and they'd have to move everything over to the next <laughs> railway line uh, to go back. You know, it's like, um, you know, in Western Australia, uh, you know, they had Aussie rules football. Now, I thought that's all that was ever played. And when I uh, moved, my father was a miner and um, you know, he moved across to Tasmania first where the main sport over there, funnily enough, was basketball and velodromes at the time, even though there was some other sports played. And then we went to New South Wales and rugby, you know, the two forms that I had no idea of. Um, so, yeah, uh, each state may have, you know, because of the distance, I imagine, and a different ide ideology and the different ways the state started. Um, so very uh, different. So the core was there but the uh, regularity and consistency between laws um, uh, was not evident. So if I was a, a national company, it would be extraordinarily difficult uh, to comply to all the rules because, uh, you know, they, you know, they would be intrinsically different from one place to another, like the old standard gauge and narrow gauge railway line. So um, now uh, something amazing happened, uh, you know, uh, not not being a political person, you know, uh, more you tend to raise your eyebrows every time, um, you know, politics are on TV, is, uh, but uh, the government at the time, and I believe it had been discussed uh, well before this decision, um, it, uh, they um, um, then uh, nationalised the, um, um, the safety law. Um, so it's called the Model Workplace Health and Safety Laws and the cell then had to happen uh, to each individual state uh, for them to adopt. There's still some little uh, uh, differences and things that they prefer or whatever, but it, in essence, the law's the same in every state apart from Victoria. Victoria is the one that's still yet to adopt it. Um, um, but uh, we, we now have uh, national workplace health and safety legislation, which is great. 
but anybody, uh, you know, the, the requirement of businesses is to, is to consult in regards to um, uh, legislation. And we can all see, um, you know, that, uh, you know, legislation, this is just the Workplace Health and Safety Act. Um, so, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a lot of content there that, um, uh, that needs to be absorbed. And, I, and look, all safety people don't know this back to front too. We, we're always referencing, uh, researching uh, and seeing where it jumps. So you've got the act, as I uh, explained uh, in our first video, is what you have to do. And then there's the regulation uh, goes through how you do it. Um, and I use that example of, of emergency procedures, for instance. And so prior to 2011 is where uh, Queensland adopted. I'm using Queensland legislation just for simplicity. Um, there's, uh, there's some idiosyncrasies with uh, Queensland legislation, as I'll show you when we get to building fire safety. But in essence, we're pretty well the same around uh, the Australia, apart from Victoria. So the regulation tells you uh, how to do it. So Act tells you what you have to do. Um, you know, so you have to consult. So who do you consult with? I mean, is do we ring the regulator up? Um, yeah, sure, you can bring the regulator up. So uh, all you got to do is uh, get hold of, um, you know, your, your WorkSafe uh, body in in uh, any state uh, and uh, tell them what your difficulties. The problem is, is that um, their job is not to write uh, a, a safe work method statement for you or uh, create your policies or things like that and give you guidance. Um, but it does get confusing when you look at some of the language that, that happens within uh, the legislation. So, um, you know, uh, you know where uh, workers have a, a legal right to cease work. Um, but what does that mean? You know, so you go to the legislation and, and, and explains in the legislative form of what that requirement is. So um, remember the act is what you have to do, the regulations, how you do it. And the code of practice is for things that are more complex, okay? Now, with the code of practice, you have to do uh, what it says or better. So you can see uh, here all the different uh, codes of practice that there are um, to do with electrical safety, um, um, uh, excava excavation, because, uh, you know, people dig holes, don't put the right um, uh, supports in, and uh, and people have died from it. So there's uh, there's rules in regards to what you have to do. First aid in the workplace. Okay, and so these are continually being updated, is it, Bruce? I, I can see they've all got different dates there too. Th so, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and even if we're looking at this Been example, created. we've gone from uh, the act to the regulation to codes of practice, depending on what you're doing. Uh, but everybody uh, will has to do the code of practice for facilities. That's that one we mentioned. Uh, in the um, in the uh, first podcast, so if I um, just try and find that is so the code of practice for facilities um, uh, managing uh, work environment facilities code of practice doesn't matter what you're working in, whether it's a, a you know a, a, a tent, a sea container, a, a multi-story building, a, you know a, a single shop. Um, the, uh, this goes through all the things that, uh, that need to happen within that facility. Okay, so if it says you've got uh, a uh, need to have a first aid kit, well, then you jump over to the Code of Practice Facilities to see how you comply to those requirements. A lot of people think it's all common sense, you know, but uh, I, I always have said to people I've taught over the years, in in previous life when I was in healthcare, there is no sense that's common between humans, you know. So, uh, one, 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 yeah, yeah. So, um, but in each one of these, they have the uh, the duties of the officer, the workers, um, and uh, refers to all the legislative requirements. So, they're a they're a um, a, a, a go to. Uh, so you can see the points of legislation where it's been expanded out on. In the um, in the code, um, 
to uh, guide people in what to do. So it even mentions workstations, um, floors and surfaces, lighting, um, uh, and it just goes on ventilation. You can imagine everything. And as we know, uh, when I was referring to um, a fire or well, uh, uh, emergencies, uh, in essence, including fire, we could see the Australian standard uh, is mentioned at the bottom of this um, code of practice as a guideline. Um, and this is that knowledge and skills that Safety Hub um, brings to the client's doorstep uh, to be able to help facilitate uh, any of their obligations. So moving on from there, uh, in Queensland, they had the Fire and Emergency Services Act, um, and that's in essence guides all the, the fireys in Queensland, uh, you know, of their requirements. Um, then it, funnily enough, has a different title um, um, for its regulation. Um, so it's the Building Fire Safety Regulation, um, but is built off the Act. Um, so instead of having the same name, uh, the, the Act has a different name. Uh, now, this regulation, uh, and, and I'm not sure about the Act in other states, but the regulation uh, here is uh, not in any other state. And then it has specific requirements in regards to um, how you comply to, to um, legislation. Every other state, uh, and I, I, I should get a list together so uh, I can educate people on uh, the particular regulation um, that looks after uh, or legislation that looks after fire safety, nine times out of ten, I'm pretty sure, refers to AS 3745 Planning for Emergencies and Facilities. So that's their go-to document. Uh, in Queensland, there's not uh, the go-to document for guidance, it actually has a law, you know, so the, the regulation. So in Queensland, we have to do the building fire safety regulation. Now, uh, if it's a complex evacuation uh, and there's a, there's a bit of criteria uh, around it um, to warrant uh, having this particular person uh, of a fire safety advisor, um, uh, there's a few requirements uh, that need to fall into effect uh, for, for this particular position um, uh, to be uh, uh, adopted or, or it's a requirement to have it. Um, the fire safety advisor uh, then would use other tools um, like 3745 to create um, uh, the um, required systems within a structure uh, for emergencies to be managed, so coming from 37.45. So they need to have an emergency planning committee. Okay, so it's a multi-storey building. You know, that can be a, um, uh, you know, a person from each floor if you wanted to. Uh, you know, if we, we usually arrange a, um, a meeting room uh, for everybody to come to and the fire safety, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the emergency planning committee um, looks at all, all the, uh, how the fire safety system within the building operates. Um, so if it's uh, got a, a fire indicator panel and the emergency warning and communication system, an EWIS, an FIP or EWIS, how does that work? Um, you know, who needs instruction in it? Uh, my go-to was uh, anybody on the ground floor uh, that was, uh, a, a, you know, a, a tenant and, you know, that was close to the fire alarm and EWIS is I would, um, um, you know, we, we, we facilitate their compliance at a reduced or no cost and uh, and their job is to have a nominated person, their reception person or something like that, that would be the chief warden. So a lot of people don't realise that uh, there's another structure when you jump out into um, uh, using 3745 uh uh, in a complex uh, evacuation, like a big long building or a big tall building. Um, so uh, as, as well as the emergency planning committee, the emergency control organisation uh, needs to be enacted and taught. So that's your warden structure, chief warden, area warden, or 
deputy chief warden and so on and so forth down to your communications and first aid officer. Now, if it's a fish and chip shop, well, you don't need all that, uh, but um, do you? should you still uh, have an emergency planning committee and should you have a warden? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's what the requirement's saying, so you need to have evidence of that. Um, that's, uh, you know, I quite like the Queensland uh, legislation because uh, any business that's not a complex evacuation, so I'm pretty sure we have a fire safety advisor it's over 30 people or over 25 metres tall. Um, don't quote me. It's in there somewhere. Um, I've been a, a FSA since um, uh, the, the legislation's inception, um, you know, and I've seen the processes and things that go. And I think over time, um, uh, compliance has waned uh, because of uh, um, consultation uh, it hasn't been there. There are a lot of places I can go into and I can automatically see that it's not compliant. Um, that concerns me a bit because, uh, you know, it's if, you know, fire, for instance, is the um, least likely thing to happen and, of course, uh, could have the potentially the most devastating um, uh, um, impact. In, impact, yeah. Now, that that's a story for another podcast. Uh, we'll move on. And so, uh, Bruce, I just had a, sorry, just to, to jump in there, Bruce, I had a quick question. So we've got the Act, we've got the regulation, we've got codes of practice, we've got AS, the Australian Standard 3745, we've got building fire safety regulation. Are there any contradictions or things that may, may not be consistent bet between these things that businesses that you've come across that businesses should be aware of at all? I think there's because there's a lot of different rules and requirements here, right? With within each of these, yeah, have you yeah, ever come across any contradictions there? Not really. It, it, it's more an interpretation, um, I see. you know, is um, and delivery on the ground because you know I always go back to the small business. You know, the the, the reticulation um, guy, him and his two workers, or the fish and chip is always a go to. Um, you know, there's a, you could have in a good fish and chip shop like 10, 12 workers, you know, uh, you know, a fair size small business. Um, and what's the likelihood of them knowing any of this? So uh, this is a good time to mention if I want to start a business, all I have to do is get my ABM, um, you know, do all the tax things that I need to do and, um, and uh, you know, um, if I was buying a franchise, they give me a whole bunch of uh, stuff that I, I uh, uh, you know, that helps me comply with the franchise requirements, which should include some safety things. But generally, uh, I can hit the ground running without knowing anything about safety. Um, there's no, uh, there's a requirement, but you have to know the requirements there. And when you get to go and see the requirement, you need to be able to interpret it. So uh, because, um, you know, even if you look at legislation, you know, the Act of Regulation, it's written in such a way that it's not that easy to understand. Um, so you would go to, a, um, you know, a, a safety advisor if you're a small or medium or if you're a bigger business, you'd employ someone. Now, um, depending on, you know, because when you do uh, um, instruction, whether it's a certificate for or a diploma or whatever, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, again, all regulation and it's focused on um, on just uh, the act of regulation and codes of practice and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, you may not necessarily have a broader focus because um, you might be a young safety advisor, you know, you might not have, uh, you know, different types of experiences that, that help you grow uh, as a professional. You may be part of an organisation and, and, and have a great, um, uh, you know, um, what do they call it, um, where they, they gather all their information and make sure that they, they attend conferences and things like that, um, you know, which is a, is a great demonstration of you keeping yourself uh, current. Um, you know, nurses do the same sort of thing uh, to keep themselves current. Uh, but a lot of it... Um, you know, is is box ticking 
uh, and not focusing on actually understanding how it's delivered on the ground. Okay, I can watch a thousand podcasts and, and um, you know, uh, go and read the, the requirements all the time, but understanding how things are delivered on the ground, which is our focus, you know, providing the tools and things like that, but understanding our client and, their, and, and how they deal with their risk. And we assist with the uh, evidence and traceability side of it. Um, and, uh, and we also, you know, are happy to uh, partner with bigger businesses that have safety advisors there to be a point of, you know, if they take on the say, work hub software, which they can, uh, and we deliver it, uh, you know, and get them up and running and they just use it themselves, is um, we're, we're happy uh, to be a, a, a point of guidance purely because of the, the, the breadth of our um, experience and the tools that we have. Um, certainly there's other um, tools available like documents and things like that. Um, we utilise those. We buy them. You know, if, if a um, client has a particular job on, we'll, we will buy it and um, change the logo and globally change uh, your company name in it. And if it's a elevator work platform sitting in the uh, safe work method statement but you're not using it, we'll take that out. Um, to assist you in that, so there you go. Yeah, so I have a question here. So it seems like if a business consults with a safety advisor and they give, and for example, if, the, if that safety advisor is fairly new and they give them the incorrect information because there's, there's many rules and requirements here to be aware of, Who's liable in that situation? Is it the safety advisor that gave them the advice or information, or is it the business, the PCBU, the officer of the PCBU? It, it, it's always the officer of the PCBU, but there's um, what they call the proportion of blame. Is if I if I've given or a safety has given, uh, you know, massively incorrect uh, uh, guidance uh, that that could be and likely to be taken into. Uh, obviously, we have, um, you know, we, we, we do the best we can to not do that. Um, and so, um, you know, we have our evidence and traceability that's built into, into work. Uh, but, you know, if, if there's something we're doing, it becomes an action, you know, and that, that action can have comments in until it's resolved. Um, so um, a bigger organisations, as I said, they can have a full-time person that they can... Uh, validate the um, uh, the expense um, and even that person that works for the company um, you know they're a worker uh, there would be a proportion of blame uh, if they massively um, you know point them in the wrong direction but as a rule it, it, the officer of the PCBU it's their their obligation to consult and make decisions because they're the only ones that can make decisions on the direction of the company where money is spent and what they're going to build or the services they provide. Um, so it relies with them. It, it gets complex again uh, when there's multiple PCBUs, um, so multiple offices. So you can say a multi-storey building with lots of tenants, a shopping centre, um, you know, for example, uh, would have multiple offices of PCBUs and all obliged to consult. So... Uh, you know, is it working perfectly, the legislation around Australia? Um, I, I would be surprised if it was, um, but certainly I know of many people uh, either wanting to do it, trying to understand and make the effort, um, and I think uh, it's a growth time uh, for, for uh, legislative understanding or guidance or organisations that provide that for, for, um, uh, for business like Safety Hub. Um, there's been a lot go into where we are at the moment. Uh, where, as I say always, we're likely to make mistakes, and we do. Um, uh, but we quickly uh, um, uh, sort it out and ensure that not only the client where we've learnt the lesson uh, is um, is uh, uh, provided with those tools and educated. Uh, like even if there's new legislation, you know, ensure uh, that that's uh, uh, incorporated. Uh, we automatically uh, put that out to all our other clients. So, 
if there's a need for a new policy to be written, like uh, family and domestic violence, for instance, is uh, one that some time ago came in, is that it's automatically rolled out to everybody else. So um, That was in video format as well, wasn't it, Bruce? So it's a little bit easier for clients to, to, to digest. That's correct. Um, and it's yeah, all, so on, all on work as well, which mm -hmm. is quite convenient too. Right, okay, let's move on. So uh, now we'll move relatively quickly, purely because uh, I just want to just go through the last of the um, uh, related type legislation to just show you, um, you know, how confusing, uh, you know, uh, poor old business owner uh, average, uh, if, if we were forced to try and understand all this on your own, um, how difficult uh, it is to be able to do that. It's even difficult for safety advisors to to be able to be over it completely. That's why having such a big network and keeping yourself up to skills is uh, always important. So then you've got the Electrical Safety Act, uh, the Electrical Safety Regulation. Electricity is a big thing just on its own, so it has its own particular legislation. Um, so, uh, you know, companies that uh, um, um, perform electrical work uh, have special licences and the, um, the um, electricians, uh, again, are governed uh, by uh, their qualification and licences um, purely because uh, it's pretty easy to get killed by electricity, you know, is that when you're working up a you cold say, amount of... Yeah, absolutely. Did, would you um, say that this would be one of the most... Uh, high risk, like the most common high risk, high risks in, at a, in a workplace. Or I don't know. My 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 feeling is is uh, you know there's not um, uh, the big, a lot of people get killed by cars. You know, so there's a um, uh, you know there's a road traffic act, for instance, is that uh, limits our speed and and uh, you know. Uh, you can't have drugs and stuff, and that has its own regulation. I've got a feeling that the Electrical Safety Act and regulation is because of um, the serious injury and death that, that happens related to electricity. It's so significant, it, it's broken off uh, as its own entity. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, those out there that, 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 that uh, may have better understanding than me. But if you look at workplace health and safety, um, there's significant things within that that breaks off and becomes codes of practice. So, um, yeah, so there's yeah. laws. And not that this Im impacts on the um, Electrical Safety Act and regulation doesn't impact so much on the uh, business owner. That's more uh, companies that provide that service. I see. However, just before, is that if I'm engaging and an electrician as a business owner to do works on my behalf, either on a project or for my company, I'm obliged to make sure they are an electrician. You know, where, where's your uh -huh. current license yeah. and where's your uh, public liability? Uh, where's your safe work method statement? You know, so uh, uh, officers of PCBUs are obliged to consult. So, um, a lot of people aren't aware of that. So in the old days, I could come up uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've self-taught myself a little few things about electricity. Uh, and you could say, um, can you fix the PowerPoint for me? And I go, yeah, I can fix it. And that was it, you know, is that, uh, you know, I could go kill myself or kill someone else through shoddy work. Uh, and there was no uh, requirement uh, for um, people to consult to make sure the person you're engaging and will do it safe. And that they used to be able to, um, you know, like mitigate the responsibility. And that's gone with the new legislation. You can't mitigate your responsibility. So It seems that even when the businesses are trying to do things correctly by consulting with a safety advisor or looking into, you know, getting a reputable electrician, there's still some risk that if they hired an electrician that, for example, it's their first day on the job, they're still, you know, they're still liable in, in some way. That, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, you could have an apprentice with the electrician that the electrician has been given 
uh, the apprentice an instruction to do something that they've learned already, um, lets them do it, but doesn't check it for some reason, gets distracted. Um, and they go away and it's forgotten about. Now, that particular thing may uh, short circuit and cause a fire or whatever. There's, you know, when you add humans into it, um, there's, there's always a potential. Now, the likelihood of it happening nowadays with the way we've got set up with our good legislation and, and a fair majority uh, of uh, humans have common sense, even though I say it's not common, is um, we don't kill it. We're not killing people every five minutes, you know. Uh, I believe we kill far more people on the road. Uh, I would, I'm pretty sure, I don't know the statistics, but we do that and we call that statistics. Uh, you know, anybody killed in the workplace is a tragedy. Um, you know, so is, uh, I think that we, um, I think uh, we just need to, uh, to have better tools uh, that, like Safety Hub provide to uh, give it better evidence and traceability and, and guide and learn together uh, by having that access. Uh, instead of um, speaking to someone that would just rattle off uh, legislation, now, there are safety people that are specialists, you know, that are really good at, um, um, you know, uh, um, using cranes and rigging, uh, you know, in any particular field. But there's a fair majority that are cert for holders that are generalist, um, you know. So the requirement is on the officer of the PCBU uh, to make those final decisions. Now, prior to 2011, funnily enough, in Queensland, I'm not sure if it was anywhere, but it was definitely in Queensland, we had the, if you had over 30 people, you had to have a HUSA, a work health safety officer. Uh, and so, uh, but what happened is uh, that that uh, HUSA was dumped with everything and they're not a specialist, they're a generalist uh, for the, the, you know, the medium type companies. Um, and so with the new legislation, there's an obligation to consult. And one of the things you can do is consult with a safety advisor and or employ one, uh, you know, to demonstrate uh, your, what we refer to as due diligence, uh, you know, having a qualified person. So, um, you know, I've been in the industry a long time, well, various industries, and have a, a, a pretty good understanding of uh, how we go about uh, identifying um, risk and then we work together uh, with um, the organisation. So one... A uh, new client, uh, you know, is a radiology clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, much about uh, radiation safety. I certainly uh, it was uh, uh, part of the things that was impacted on me while I worked in healthcare. Um, but we work with their professional body to be able to gather the, uh, the workplace health and safety requirement of that. Um, to ensure that is, and it, it in essence is involving uh, uploading their requirements that they already had into WorkUp so people can acknowledge it. Uh, and if it changes, we just upload it again. So um, it, it helps. And if we want to create, sorry, go. So, Rissa, just have a question here. If, like at the moment, if a business employs a safety advisor, is there any guarantee that that safety advisor is using similar software where they can track the information that they've given to businesses or is, uh, is well, for example, we work with WorkHub, which is a very comprehensive piece of software, which, which can do many things, but uh, is this a common, common thing with safety advisors now, if, if a business employs a safety advisor? Um, well, there's lots they... of different types of software. So there's the, the safety advisor can, or officer, um, you know, there's two terms, uh, can advise or, or recommend or put a business plan forward to um, the uh, company uh, to adopt a particular tool that they, 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 uh, that they think can help facilitate safety. Uh, but as you know, um, you know, um, Safety Hut's pre previous entity uh, Bravo Zulu uh, just used um, Outlook uh, Calendar and um, and uh, uh, Dropbox. Um, so, depending on the company, a small if they've got a safety advisor, um, 
you know, they're the ones that do the research and, and uh, they, they should, uh, you know, medium to large business should already have um, um, the tools that they're using. They're just looking for something where they're going to house it. So they should have their policies and procedures that might be uh, purchased from a particular company. I don't think there's many people, safety advisors, that sit down and physically write out everything now unless they were using, a, you know, chat GPT or whatever to be able to develop things is. But that still needs a human eye over it, uh, whether it's been bought, uh, you know, you'll need to change the logo. And down in the, in, in the footer, you know, you've got your document control, so that needs to, if you're checking your, uh, your documents annually, you either got to physically go through each one of those documents and, you know, put your next uh, review date in, or there are scripts that will go through a whole bunch of Word documents and change things. I believe you have. Uh, the HR consultants that uh, we liaise with have something like that. Uh, or, um, you know, a, a software. Uh, now, WorkHub uh, definitely uh, does that docu document control automatically. Um, other software, um, you know, do it in different ways. You know, some only take PDF. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, yeah. I can imagine so, it would be very bad if, if if something happens and and they go to their safety advisor. Uh, we need evidence that we consulted with with you for this. But they don't have that. That could be a difficult situation. Well, that, those, it, it, ex know. exactly, and 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 it's being um, uh, you know if I say it's being reviewed, uh, how are we doing it? Am I physically looking at a word document now in WorkHub, for instance? Uh, we move everything over to text, especially the policies and procedures. Um, so it may start off as PDF, whatever the client's got, um, but we'll eventually move everything. So that means if we change a word, it will force a document change. Uh, so for so point, uh, you know, 1.1 to 1.2, put evidence yeah, yeah. of traceability. But look, all safety people get in it for the right reasons. It's actually uh, quite a... a, a um, honourable job to have, uh, you know, going back to when I was uh, young and in the workforce, it, was, it, it didn't exist and and then it got bigger and it um, uh, it became, uh, you know, uh, a little bit ridiculous where, um, you know, if you didn't have any injuries, this is probably more in the mining industry way back when, uh, you could get a, a really cool jacket or a... Um, a really cool uh, esky, and uh, you know people weren't reporting injuries uh, because uh, yeah, oh, I see. Were, so you, you, you put out the front zero injuries, and everybody goes off happily with their <laughs> uh, their yeah. thing. So uh, you know, lucky that changed because uh, mining is is its has its own uh, inherent risk. You know, the reason to you know completely separate um, legislative requirements. Very risky, you know, wouldn't so. it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, coal, uh, you know, uh, open pit, um, underground. It, it's, I've, 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 uh, I've uh, been involved in, uh, you know, open cut and uh, a little bit of underground. Um, yeah, big thing, big things versus human. You can pretty well say, in uh, you know, in all environments, uh, the big thing wins. Um, or the, uh, you know, the, the the wrong atmosphere or wherever, whether it's, uh, you can get in a in a tank that you think is cleaned out but it hasn't been cleaned out properly, uh, you know, you get overcome or you've got the little engine running next to you and the exhaust is coming in the tank and you, know, you end up with a with a big problem. Anyway, I think i better just uh, uh, get finish off this last um, dragging people through uh, the last of the legislative requirements. So I need you to can know. Just, yes. just, just to finish the overview and I'll go quickly. Um, there's the Workers' Compensation Re Rehabilitation Act, its regulation. So if you get someone injured, you know, the, you've got to get that person, uh, you know, back to normal health or as close as you can. So, um, you know, you know, I've dealt with um, um, deaths in the workplace and serious injury and then manage the workplace and, uh, and workers back as close as we can, but it's, it's, it, it's devastating. Um, you know, you don't go to work to have an injury. And in some cases, people are mostly aware of this one, is you can have a, an aggravation of a pre-existing injury. 
that, mm. that uh, we even knew about or we didn't. Um, one particular uh, client I have has a guy with an injury from another workplace, um, but he was he, he's a great worker. We, he wanted the job. He got the opportunity. He excels in it. Um, so we do the best we can to be able to support that person, you know, so because um, uh, you want them. But his injury may get aggravated. So uh, that can be a work cover claim, you know. So uh, in Queensland, you're obliged uh, if you if there's an injury that happens that's likely to be a work cover claim, you have to report that, uh, and you've got to tell the worker that they're entitled to make a claim. Um, so we 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 facilitate that through work hub through the forms module, um, and we either guide the worker what to do or we do it for the company, um, and uh, work cover. We'll send the um, uh, the uh, you know document. We'll PDF the document and associate it to the incident. So, therefore, our clients that are, that adopt our uh, HR um, services as well, which is not not hugely expensive, um, but value adds to our safety. Some just want the safety. Some are happy. Uh, you know, they've only got three people. Now, funnily enough, is that we do have a company uh, with a small amount of people that uh, uh, was enthusiastic to adopt it too. And we don't do a lot for them, um, but, uh, you know, if they have any issues, at least they've got someone uh, to bounce off. And we wouldn't jealously guard that if you weren't a client of that particular service. We'd certainly uh, advise and guide and and uh, and, and uh, uh, help facilitate or encourage to sign up to it. Um, so we can uh, help assist because that's a side of um, of um, uh, sort of well, the return to work rehab is, you know, dealing with um, you can bring someone back on suitable duties. And, and what are those suitable duties? So uh, you've got a, there's some medical certificates that just say he has time off and the other is a, a work capacity certificate that comes, you know, part of the fair work report. And the, the doctor might say they can come back for two days or four hours a day, you know, and we go, well, what's the best, uh, you know, they, they can sit at the desk and do computer work. They can f- facilitate that type of thing. So normally you've got to have your safety person and then your return to work rehab coordinator, um, you know, or someone at least with that uh, training. Um, you, it can be a separate person. but uh, um, So we have that as well that we can offer. Uh, then you're getting in away from safety where you've got your Fair Work Act and Fair Work regulations. So that comes down to, you know, how people are paid, and, you know, uh, contracts and other bits and pieces, you know, unfair dismissal type uh, issues, Industrial Relations Act, regulation, anti-discrimination. And then, of course, you've got your Australian standards. Uh, recently, we had a client that, um, uh, you know, needed uh, some information on uh, emergency eyewash showers and equipment. Now these are uh, the um, standards Australia um, uh, protect their copyright. Um, it's probably the strongest I've ever seen. Uh, it's it's really strong now. So whatever you buy um, from them, uh, like I th- I'm pretty sure I only had the ability to print it out twice, and then I think it can track if I wanted to email it, for instance. So you know it's mine, and I can only keep it for. Uh, you know, our use. So uh, everything else uh, out there is free, but when you're getting into Australian standards, like 3745, uh, you've got to buy it. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how much is that worth. Is, is this an Australian agency that that sells this, or you say, are you yeah, buying yeah. from the government? Or yeah. no, no, no. This, this, uh, I, I, I literally can't remember. I vaguely think years ago it may have been something to do uh, with government or an organisation, um, but it, 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 it's a company, uh, and uh, oh, the wow. standards where they're they're, they're recognised in New Zealand as well. So there's the Australian and New Zealand, and you can buy international standards through them. So they have a process. Um, when it's being reviewed, you know, they, they might be in Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne and people get invited. I've, I've been on one. It was a, I think it was a 37.45 one. Um, and um, where subject professionals and companies associated to the particular stand, they get together and uh, come up with any sort of chops and changes and, 
things in the standards is then deemed to be um, you know um, reviewed and, and it's reset. So uh, 3745 uh, was um, 2010 was the last time that happened. But just after that, there were some amendments that were happened. So they removed some things to do with uh, uh, evacuation diagrams, for instance. And I can't remember what else, but yeah. So um, in short, uh, if you if your brain's not hurting by now, um, it should be. <laughs> it's, <Slightly. like> <laughs> it's very. It's, it can be very overwhelming, but I think it, it's good yeah. to have these Bruce because it it really uh, brings awareness to, to 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 the complexity of things here, and that you really want to speak to a to a, a, you know a very experienced and knowledgeable professional in this area. Yeah, and that's what we're growing things, uh, right. in Work Hub. There's there's what I do. Uh, it's um, the way. Uh, Safe Out Studios is developing, um, you know, all those years ago, um, you know, and, and now we're, um, our, our podcasting is not just to, to um, um, spread the word, uh, for want of better words, is that it's also a tool, uh, you know, to do with our, uh, you know, um, clients uh, having evidence and traceability of um, uh, toolbox meetings and safety consult meetings. So it's the video, um, and we all know, uh, people will watch videos. They won't read anything. Um, they'll just acknowledge it. So, um, you know, to have this ability is good. In addition to, uh, um, I'm not sure if the viewers understand that we do video procedures as well. Um, so um, uh, you can have the written procedure, and I, I can pretty well guarantee uh, people will have evidence of people acknowledging the existence of a policy or procedure but they won't read it. Uh, you know, it's um, whether that's in mining or healthcare or wherever, it's very rare uh, that someone could put their hand on their heart and say, yes, 100% I, um, I read it. But video procedures are great, um, especially for those key risks. Um, and we, we do that simply by um, guiding the uh, company in what to do, how to gather the, uh, the video information. Um, that just gets dumped in a, a, a Dropbox folder uh, that's provided for them and sucks all the information. We do that with our document reviews as well. We provide the client and they can just put all their, whatever they have into it so we can have a look at it. And then uh, our studio kicks into action and, uh, you know, transcribes and uh, closed captions yeah. and voiceovers and puts logos on and does transitions and wacko, uh, there you go, you've got a really good... Um, video procedure that can be acknowledged and goes part of your um, uh, compliance regime. Now, our compliance on WorkUp is make the green, uh, make the red green, you know, and, yes. and, and uh, yes. as simple as that. And uh, for those that um, uh, are enjoying these podcasts, uh, next Saturday uh, we will have uh, uh, Mike Carney from WorkUp and uh, we'll be going through the WorkUp software as well so that's going to be exciting uh, for those uh, looking at the history of uh, where it happened and how our relationship has formed with WorkUp uh, you know and what we see is going to happen in the future in regards to Australia and New Zealand. Okay well Bruce we've just hit one hour and I'd, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for your time and this has been a it's been a very interesting podcast with, to, to, to see how 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 much you know how much background information really goes into safety um so thank you for your time and we'll see you next next week in the podcast sure well they're going to be an exciting one everybody so uh, if you want to have a good look at this software then it's your chance so we'll see you next saturday thanks Ruth. okay thank you everyone